Hello and welcome to our presentation Unity to Reality. First of all, I want to thank Unity for this opportunity to share our experience on training and deploying AI for the robotics industry. Hi, I'm Daniel Majonica, simulation engineer at Cross Compass, an AI company based in Tokyo, Japan. Today's presentation is in two parts. First, I will explain our new synthetic data generation techniques for AI training. Then, later on, we will have a Q&A session led by Hitoshi Yoshida, our head of digital business, with our partner from Essentia, Sang Kyung Song, regarding how this new technology will impact the future of the robotics industry. A little bit about myself. I've worked with Unity for five years now on different games and virtual reality applications. Then at Cross Compass, I've been involved in several projects for clients in robotics and manufacturing, creating simulated environments for AI training. So for today's presentation, I will first go over the context, scope of our demo, synthetic data generation, domain randomization, physics engine validation, and finishing with our Q&A with Essentia Innovation Hub Tokyo. Let's start with the context for this project. We are trying to solve the shortage of labor forces in the industry. Because of the aging population in Japan and more and more countries, less and less people become available to work in the factory and therefore we need to find efficient ways to program equipment and robots automatically without the need of human intervention. Artificial intelligence may be the solution, but it typically requires hours of data collection to set up with every new task which is not a viable option in most cases. At Cross Compass, we've achieved a new type of technology that can train an AI to program a robot without requiring any data collection. We use Unity to create synthetic data and then we use this data to train an AI. But why are we using synthetic data, you may ask? Since our data is generated in simulation, we can avoid many safety checks normally required to set up data collection environments. It then allows us for faster iterative cycles of AI training and testing and simulation. Additionally, we overcome man hour requirements because the simulation automatically provides an unlimited amount of data with as much as precision as we want. And finally, we can also use simulation as a mockup or demo to discuss specifications with clients beforehand, which is very convenient. So for this demo, we have a precise goal. Uh, we want to grasp objects from a table with a robotic hand. As input, the AI needs to get a picture taken from a camera above the table. The image the AI sees will be 640 by 640 pixels RGB image. On the video on the right, you can see that the top image is the camera view. The Im the, and as you can see, the image needs to be cropped and resized before sending it to the air. Details like this are very important if we want to synthetically create more data that has similar camera properties than the real world. Then the AI will, will be trained to take this top view image as an input and to output the control commands for the robot to grasp each of the objects on the table. The control commands sent by, by the AI to the robot is going to be in the format of four values. In this demo, X and Y represent the coordinates in millimeters on the table of the image, uh, and Z represents the height where the robot will perform the grasp, also in millimeters, and theta represents the rotation of the robotic arm in degrees. So how do we generate synthetic data in order to achieve these results? First thing we have to do for every data generation is to assert the real life situation. We need to ask a few questions. What is the image size and format? Where are windows, light bulbs, and other sources of light? What colors and physical properties uh, do the objects and the background have? or what are the camera properties. If we take all of these points into account, we can achieve a result in simulation that looks similar to the camera image on the left. We still have one more task in order to be able to train any AI. 
we need to create the label where to grasp the object. Most commonly, we can add a label directly to the game object since it is required to grasp the object in a specific position. For this visualization of the labels on the right picture, we chose to represent the distance from the camera by length of the bar in order to show all four values x, y, z, theta in our label debug image. As you can see, recreating the real environment in simulation requires us to know a lot about the real life situation. But what if something unexpected happens? What if, for example, the robot will be moved to a different part of the factory and the light is completely different? Our AI would most likely fail. In order to prevent this, we developed a solution which is based on domain randomization. Domain randomization is a technique to recreate noisy conditions in the simulated environment. As you can see in this drawing, with domain randomization, we are trying to capture reality in our distribution of domain randomized simulations. This has two positive effects. First, we don't have to calibrate our simulation as much as before. And second, we make the air more robust uh, to en environmental changes. Domain randomization can be used in several different aspects of simulation, like physical parameters or anything that can affect the scene. But since we only want to recreate a camera image in this demo, we will focus on visual domain randomization, or VDR for short. In order to make VDR an effective tool, we've decided to write it as a custom Unity package, since many projects can benefit from the robustness of the AI that comes with VDR. This plugin can speed up our future iteration process for new projects and demos. Unity's high definition render pipeline gives us a good framework for this. This plugin is highly modular and uh, very easy to use. After installing the plugin to the project, we only have to make a few things um, in order to make it work. The first thing would be to add the VDR manager to the scene that you want to use the plugin in. Then you effectively only have to change three lines in order for it to functionally work correctly. Since this is a custom package fitting for our needs, we decided to make it very modular, which requires a little bit more setup in the scene for some things to work properly. To the scene lights that should be controlled by the video plugin, we need to add a component to the corresponding game object. And the same workflow applies to the HDR sky volume that comes with HDRP, and also the mesh render objects in the scene. For more control over the rendering of objects, we wrote a custom shader with Unity's shader graph. Also, if we change the HDR sky, it results in real-time global illumination changes. So what if you don't want to control a specific object in the scene? It doesn't need to have the corresponding component on it. And if you want to temporarily disable the effects on VDR on any of those objects, you can just disable the component for a little bit. Currently, we are using an XML file in order to keep track of our options and to adjust the bonds of our random distribution for every dimension. As of now, we have the option to control the HDR sky, scene lights, and textures. But we have plans to extend our plugin for camera settings, post-processing effects, meshes, and many more. Internally, we created a modular system to extend our plugin with these models without much effort. So here are some example results for the demo we made with VDR. As you can see, we can achieve many different extreme and even unnatural environmental conditions. Since we can easily generate lots of synthetic data, we can apply big variants in our VDR. The point is, that by varying environmental conditions randomly, uh, like for instance here the background, the AI will learn to ignore these kind of changes once deployed in the real world. With this, we have successfully created our synthetic data set and can train the AI on these labeled images. But before we actually deploy this AI on the real robot, we want to make sure that the command control command is correct. In previous cases of AI testing, we could just make sure that the grasping position is in a small margin from the actual label, the ground truth. But we face several problems with this approach. One of those problems you can see in this picture. 
the label is colored in green, while the air's uh, output is either red or orange. Red means the output was in the margins, orange means the output is outside of the margins. As you can see for the yellow object, the AI's output uh, is outside of the margin due to the grasping command here in orange being rotated 90 degrees in comparison with the label in green. But it doesn't mean that this grasping position is necessarily wrong. And if we would test it with a real robot, we could see that the yellow object in fact can be grasped with this command. In order to prevent this, we can validate the co control commands by placing the objects in simulation. Using this physics check, we can make sure that the object is in between our grippers. If this is the case, we can then do two other physics checks to ensure that the grippers themselves are in a free position for the robotic arm to wrap around the object. In Unity, we, we could use physics overlap box, the function physics overlap box, for all these checks. Unfortunately, <laughs> we still have a problem with this validation technique. In some cases, we still can't assure that the object is actually graspable, even though our physics check is valid. For instance, looking at the drawing on the left, both grippers are clear and the object does in fact overlap with their aperture as requested. And yet the object is most likely to slip away here. Uh, an additional way to check uh, and would be to simulate the real conditions more accurately, which is why we use rigid body movement to close the grippers and test if the object can be successfully grasped. In addition to the physics validation, we can also use simulation to as an effective tool to test our communication protocols. Whichever protocol we use, standard robotic communication protocol like ROS, or custom client pro protocols. We can test them in different scenarios and validate the whole solution with the client before deploying on the real robot. And these are some results with the demo. The AI is controlling this robotic arm, although it has never seen a real image. We also tested different lighting conditions, turning off the LEDs, closing the blinds, or even directed a flashlight directly at the table. In all of those conditions, the AI was able to find and successfully grasp all the objects from the table. So next up, we have a Q&A session with our partner from Accenture Innovation Hub Tokyo to talk more about this technology and how it's driving the industry forward. This is Yoshida. I'm in charge of the management of the digital business department across Compass. Our task is to improve the uh, value of the customers uh, with using the uh, AI technology, which is called as a, a digital transformation these days. Anyways, uh, we would like to thank you for taking your time, Mr. Son. Thank you, Yoshida-san, for inviting me. I'm sang Yong Song at Accenture, a uh, strategy and consulting industry X. Um, our mission is to uh, innovate clients, um, manufacturing industries, uh, lines and procedures, and their ideas, products, and even services. Uh, for uh, the innovation of client side, uh, we really want to deploy uh, AI technology to a real world manufacturing industry. Thank you, Sonsan. This is our, our second year of our cooperations. How did you think the last year's performance of the AIs? Uh, thank you for the uh, continual uh, effort and support from Cross Compass. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we have uh, validated uh, and built a demonstration in two years. And uh, at first year, uh, that was a, a tough year for uh, both of us because uh, we see the many issues, uh, but uh, we have faced it uh, one by one and treated it and uh, solved it one by one. Uh, first year, uh, we have uh, built the uh, robot demonstration and uh, also uh, done the validation test with the robots. Uh, we have uh, originally aimed to grasp the level of AI uh, and also the use case that should be seen at our manufacturing client sites. Uh, we are targeting that uh, our clients uh, change their manufacturing 
uh, wise in the way that human cooperates with AI uh, to investigate uh, such area. Uh, we really need to uh, validate with the real robots, with real AI. Um, and the results was uh, that we found the result was uh, uh, good and uh, also uh, need improvements at first year uh, because we have seen the typical issue that would uh, always be seen in most AI deployment scenes. Uh, for example, we should take uh, time to uh, build the AI and uh, we should take the time to uh, collect the data uh, to train the simulation with AI and even uh, we should need to uh, also modify the AI at the field of robot site. So uh, we have uh, consumed a bunch of time at first year uh, that would be uh, seen as a typical issue at manufacturing um, industry uh, manufacturing lines and actually the, the data acquisition cost on the customer must be the bottleneck uh, to adapt to ai into the real uh, production line uh, not only from your side uh, we issue the similar feedback uh, during the uh, last uh, years and uh, we really consider about the countermeasures <laughs> after your uh, continual uh, support the effort uh, we have seen the uh, very good progress in the second year because of uh, cross compass engineers uh, dedicated very well to uh, uh, improve their AI uh, that we uh, already, we, we now don't need a uh, uh, time to uh, collect the data and uh, no need that time to uh, fix the lighting conditions at our uh, real world field. Uh, so now uh, AI can be very robust and uh, uh, yeah, uh, cross compass engineer uh, shares the idea about the uh, complex domain randomization and they implemented it. The key point is uh, uh, Unity allows us to generate the massive training data in the different writing situations and the surface characteristic and so on. Afterward, uh, we reach the latest test result, uh, as you know, and perfect scores without any data acquisition with the real robot. And this must be uh, really good for the customers that we believe. We are very satisfied with your work and your uh, AI. We have um, changed many conditions that uh, real uh, working robots are uh, placed. Uh, for example, we have uh, modified the uh, lighting conditions, so uh, we have modified uh, uh, placement in the uh, actual uh, sites and we have also uh, considered uh, many other uh, environmental conditions uh, that would be seen at the real world client sites and uh, we have uh, created a very fantastic AI uh, to really uh, solve the uh, real world uh, engineering problem that effort was very fantastic I would like to say that to be honest, uh, due to the COVID-19, we uh, couldn't test so much, just two times, uh, to do the validations. We had only two days uh, after COVID-19 uh, to uh, really uh, validate the robot on the AI. And uh, that was a tough condition for a cross compass. Uh, but uh, you did it very good, and uh, that was fantastic. And uh, in the limited conditions, uh, uh, in COVID-19, uh, our clients will also uh, see the same situation afterwards. Uh, so uh, AI would be a uh, good support for human, uh, especially um, manufacturing preparation uh, procedure or even uh, developing phase. Uh, AI would be a good support for human work. I feel that like that. I think that this is a uh, correct direction now. Yeah. So maybe you have the several challenges uh, uh, for this kind of field uh, in the, your company, Accenture. Uh, how are you planning the uh, value change or value creation with the uh, uh, service, including the AI technologies in the future? We um, assume that uh, our manufacturing would be uh, diverse uh, more and more. Uh, for example, we need to see the uh, 
products, even services uh, to be personalized even more. Uh, now we can uh, select a bunch of uh, products so with a bunch of valuation, uh, even in the web or even at the sales people uh, of the product. But uh, from now, that variation would be more diverse uh, by the uh, technology commodity uh, process. Uh, AI would be uh, typically uh, used in, in that kind of uh, um, additional variation of uh, at the products and even services. Uh, for example, uh, in the manufacturing line, uh, we will uh, need to uh, apply the AI uh, to uh, operate the uh, valuation of procedures. Uh, for example, uh, one product have a uh, hundred uh, parts uh, in it, and a hundred parts would be uh, selected by a uh, million of people uh, at the uh, customer side, by the uh, web or uh, in other uh, methodologies. And uh, at the manufacturing uh, field line, the uh, product valuation would be fixed by the AI yeah, super personalization. You mentioned in the past. Yeah, uh, we say it like hyper personalization. But hyper -personalization yeah. AI should support the human uh, in the um, manufacturing uh, decision lines uh, to uh, really uh, enrich the um, personalization of products. And uh, as you mentioned, the uh, AI and some uh, new technology must support the humans uh, so much uh, to supporting the uh, the engineer who is working in the production line and also the uh, yeah, real customer of the user. I want to say that we can uh, contribute to the, uh, such kind of challenge together. And <laughs> it's, of course. Uh, in Japan, uh, we have many AI ventures and technology ventures, uh, but uh, most of them are targeting uh, the surrounding of manufacturing fields. But uh, you are going into the center of uh, manufacturing field. So uh, that position would be working for our business cooperation. Thank you for your comments. For the technology which we uh, validated in the last year and this year, so we are discussing how to accelerate the uh, current AI technology for robotics uh, with such kind of technology and also the how to expand the uh, core technology to another field. And our uh, first entrance um, to dive into the real AI deployment in our uh, manufacturing industry would be uh, firstly uh, knowing the client's uh, procedure and issues uh, that uh, would be really seen uh, when facing the uh, error of um, people at the uh, manufacturing industries uh, decreasing. Up. So we should. Uh, rapidly make up with uh, the kind of uh, loss of uh, technology and human heritage yeah, that old people, uh, experienced people had at the client uh, site. Uh, but they're uh, uh, getting older and so uh, we should rapidly uh, think of how AI can really support yeah, in the near future, the AI must be the supporter for us. Someone says that AI will yeah, replacement, but uh, both of us are not believing it. Yes, same opinion. First place would be a uh, very simple step that we should take uh, with the technology of AI. And uh, there is a uh, comprehension of uh, clients' uh, manufacturing procedures find out a uh, uh, simple key uh, to really deploy AI that would be a first. And second would be um, how to uh, balance the human and AI at the um, extreme site. Um, maybe um, that would be uh, five years later or 10 years later uh, in the future. Uh, we'll see the human and AI, AI cooperates 50-50 uh, at real manufacturing and maybe uh, as you mentioned uh, 
uh, human would be uh, making a decision. Uh, that decision would be a quite important decision that should be made by human, uh, not uh, uh, replaced by the AI or other technologies. Uh, I, I think like that. Yeah. So sometimes uh, I would like to uh, say that, uh, thank you for taking your time and really appreciate at your uh, cooperation to every time. Thank you from my side uh, for your effort and uh, dedication uh, to uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. To wrap things up, we use Unity to create simulations for AI training. First, we generate synthetic data. Then we apply a technique called domain randomization in order to increase the robustness of the AI. We also use Unity's physics engine to check if the control commands sent by the AI could effectively grasp the object in reality. This project in collaboration with Accenture was focused on creating a demo of our technology based on Unity, so we can showcase it to potential clients and partners. Today, we are already using this technology in consulting projects, and we continue to develop our tools and methods further, thanks to the support of Unity. Thank you for attending this Unite Now session and on training and developing AI for industrial robots. We hope you learned something today. Contact us or send us feedback or questions. Finally, check out our Unity blog if you're interested. Thank you.